Hey viewers, welcome to this episode. We are still on the presentation of the schools of thought that inform the social foundations and perspective of law. The other time we talked about number two school of thought and that is legal positivism and those who inspired it and what it stands for. Today we would like to look at number three school of thought, the historical school of thought. And there's no any other person most qualified other than German legal philosopher and thinker that was influenced by the critical school of Frankfurt, uh, Karl von Savigny. It is a difficult name to pronounce, but well, Savigny's view is explaining the topic today that the definition of law should not be deprived from its historical basis. And he is right to look at the lawmaking process that is parliament, uh, an arm of government that is mandated with the lawmaking, law amendment, repeal of law, abrogation of law. And in his analysis, he sees the role played by the legislator in the lawmaking. And he sees that if the lawmaker comes from a given community, during the lawmaking process, of course, he represents the will of his community, of the members of his community. But also, as a person, he has his historical background. He has certain values. He has some traditions that he will chip in with, obviously, while debating the law in Parliament. This gives the law another feather, that is the historical aspect or nature of law. So the law in terms of the Bill of Parliament, adopted by Parliament, and um, signed into law by the executive and gazetted uh, by the government has got a lot to do with the personification of the legislator as well. And it is in this argumentation that we see that some bills of parliament remain forever bills of parliament and some are thrashed into the dustbin. Why? Because legislators fail to agree on certain values in principle that may not tally well with the communities that they represent. And this one gives the law the historical format. And uh, it would not make much sense to look at the law uh, from the positivist perspective that dismisses any other authority or guideline while making the law uh, and uh, talking of the law as what is other than what ought to be. So in this case, uh, Savigny is in support of saying that law has so much to do with the context, the social context. Law has so much to do with the people at that particular time. And that is why the law of 10 years back may not be relevant with the communities or the people living today. The law of some years in the past may be repealed, may become old, because it is not relevant with the trends and changes in the society today. Uh, Savigny has a point to tell us that law has got so much to do with the lawmaker, with the legislator, and the legislative process takes into account uh, the inputs by the legislators from their constituencies. And in this kind of clear and critical analysis of the law, from where I sit, I still see a lot of nexus of the law 
with the people living in a social context and in the society. Uh, law is more of today and tomorrow. Law is about the present and the future other than the past. And in that case, we find that the embodiment of the nature of law entails the nature and the perspective of the lawmaker at that particular time. And this again gives the law the dynamism of historical participation, uh, the communities represented, the will of the people represented in the process of the lawmaking. And in this case, again, we repeat by alluding to the fact that the pure science of law uh, may not exclude uh, other aspects of law, like historical aspects, sociological aspects, and as well as cultural aspects, the values of the people, the legal values that we see in the traditions, the customs, the belief patterns and systems, uh, and what people take to be the good law or bad law for them. Uh, in this kind of explanation, we see again from the Germanic uh, perspective, background, uh, Max Weber, the founder of legal sociology, uh, 20th century sociologist, uh, most read and uh, widely traveled researcher who came up with a proper analysis of the law when he talks about historical authority, then charismatic authority, and rational legal authority in his explanation of what bureaucracy is. Uh, Weber looked at the historical authority from the perspective of the monarchs, that the father passes the authority to the son, and that is in the historical authority. Charismatic authority, Weber looks at some individuals that may acquire that authority uh, from their charisma, from uh, the way the people look at them. Maybe they are good orators, they are good speakers, they are very persuasive in political rhetorics, but as well as people who are able to attract followers just as magnet. He gave the example of Napoleon Bonaparte that attracted so many people around himself and he became uh, an authority just by virtue of being charismatic. But above all, the most mature civilization and level of bureaucracy in every society is seen in the rational legal authority. And that is when now uh, there is the question of the rule of law, uh, there is division of labor, for instance, there is a, a kind of uh, legal framework and uh, a chain of command, somebody commanding and others following. There is impersonification in labor, in the profession, as well as avoiding issues such as nepotism. This gives uh, the understanding of law from the objective perspective, but again upholds the law as one of the most critical social control systems par excellence that cannot miss in any given and functioning society. So this kind of sociological analysis, historical analysis, comes from Germany. And it is again uh, very good for us to cover that part and uh, see that within our understanding and knowledge of law, we don't leave out some schools of thought. And next time, I expect again to look together with you at the schools of thought that are very vital. Thanks for following and encouraging us to continue. University of Nairobi, uh, School of Law, Kisumu Campus, and Peter. Thank you.